Now this evening, I want to share with you some things that the Lord has been teaching me from a passage of scripture which you yourselves, I believe, have been studying, those of you who attend the Sunday services here. And that helps me very much. The ground of the, the scripture is not going to be altogether unfamiliar. Uh, but I want to share some of the fresh things that have come home to me in recent years from the well known oft preached upon passage of Romans chapter 6 of course you might say oh no not that chapter <laughs> because really it's tantalized us for so long we've wrestled with it and we think we've got to understand it and then not sure that we have and I know exactly how you feel but all I can say to you I've had my battles with this great scripture and for years laid it aside and said Lord you'll have to bring it bring me back to it later on and perhaps you'll do so through another door and I shall find it meaning something much simpler than I thought it to mean now this before I say more about it let's read we won't read the whole chapter but I'm going to read that part of the chapter which we don't read so much the first few verses we've gone over that but we don't get the last part so much so I'm going to read to you from verse 14 to the end. We shall have re reference to the whole of the chapter, of course. But let's read from verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves slaves, that's the word, there are two Greek words for servants, one is a diakonos and the other is daulos, the, the latter meaning a, a slave in our sense of the word, a servant. The first word is one who receives wages, but not a slave. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves slaves to obey, his slaves ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness but God be thanked that ye were the servants or the slaves of sin but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you being then made free from sin ye became the servants or the slaves of righteousness I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh for as ye have yielded your members slaves to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity even so now yield your members slaves to righteousness unto holiness for when ye were the slaves of sin ye were free from righteousness isn't that an interesting verse he said there was a time when you were as completely free from righteousness as could be that can, that's, a, that's a good description of the man outside of Christ he's free from righteousness oh I can do as I like but when he becomes a Christian he becomes a slave of God and he becomes free from sin for when ye were the slaves of sin ye were free from righteousness what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed for the end of those things is death but now being made free from sin we can be as free from sin as we once were free from righteousness really quite a provocative thought you can be as free from sin as you once were free from righteousness but now being made free from sin and become slaves to God ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord 
as a young Christian I used to pour over this particular chapter I thought it somehow held to me the secret of victory and much else that I longed for for instance this verse had that great text sin shall not have dominion over you and then three times it uses the phrase being then made free from sin and I was quite sure the secret of victory and sanctification was to be found in this chapter I longed to enter in I longed if there was a second or a third or a fourth blessing I wanted that indeed I remember getting down on my knees having read a book on the second blessing as it was called saying Lord I don't want to get into bed until I've received it and I knelt down but I did go to bed without having received that just couldn't stay up all night and I used to feel it was somewhere here and in due course God did reveal very precious things which helped me very much and indeed I used to love to preach the message of this chapter in my meetings and when the Lord called me into full time evangelistic work from a bank in London I went into the, the ministry with a twofold message salvation for the lost and sanctification for the Christian and as I understood it the latter for me was based on this passage and though God did bless me at one stage very much through its message the time came when it died on me and I used to try to reckon myself dead to sin that's one of the verses we had, didn't actually cover but whereas the old man was said to be crucified he just wouldn't lie down <laughs> and that line of things that have been such a help seemed to be dead to me and then it was that God sent back to England missionaries and African leaders from revival in East Africa which revival continues <coughs> to this very day 40 years of it and they came with just the message I needed I was in such need they came with a much simpler message than I was trying to embrace <coughs> that simple message of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ it was really simply the gospel which I'd been preaching to those that were without but I saw it had to be applied to myself as a Christian that old old story of Jesus and his love and I had to see it had to be applied to me it was so simple and God really began to work in my heart in a new way but I used to argue especially with this team from East Africa what about Romans 6, 7 and 8 what about identification with Christ what about dying with Christ they seemed to have little or nothing to say upon that aspect of truth they could only speak that which was being made real to them and they said Roy don't argue get right with God brother there are things that we're sure in which you need to repent even as we've had to repent you need to go back to the cross and so I, at last I consented to lay aside my doctrinal and theological arguments and to take a sinner's place again though I was an evangelist I had to take a sinner's place and find a sinner's peace again at the foot of the cross he showed me wherein I needed to repent things that I had been blind to things I hadn't been calling sin and bit by bit he began to reveal the man I really was and he showed me that the whole lot of it had been anticipated and settled by the Lord Jesus in his body on the tree and I could know peace again and liberty again but I used to say but what about those well-worn doctrines of sanctification which I used to mill over so much and which I used to try and give to other people which at one point seemed to help me and seemed to help others what about that I said this to myself I didn't take it up with anybody else and I said I know what I'm going to do I'm just going to lay all those themes that I use so much aside and I'm just going to go on with those things that the Lord is making real and personal to me 
And I believe that later on in God's time he'll lead me back to those well-worn scriptures and show me their meaning. And I have a feeling I'll come into them through another door. And I'm going to find that they mean something much simpler than I was making them. More than that, I think I'm going to find that they're consistent with this new simple message of grace and the power of the blood of Jesus which had come to me. And I would say in some measure God has indeed in these more recent years led me back to these scriptures and I found it as I thought it was. I've come in to see them through another door and they mean something much simpler and much more practical to me than I thought. And so I want to share a few of these things the Lord has given and I'm hoping that you're going to be blessed because I believe that this great chapter is the charter for freedom for the saint. It's a great, triumphant, joyous chapter. I want to pick on verse 14 to begin with. This is the one, the verse from which I want to try and begin. Sin shall not have dominion over you for ye are not under the law but under grace now this verse speaks of three things at least first of all it speaks of the dominion of sin inasmuch as it says sin shall not have dominion over you it implies that apart from the provisions God has made sin does have dominion over us and I think it's very important that we should understand wherein the dominion of sin over us consists now I used to think that to be under the dominion of sin meant that I had acquired certain sinful habits and practices which now had become habitual that their fascination was something that I couldn't resist and I was going on doing them almost helplessly I used to think that that was the dominion of sin and I used to think that this verse was suggesting that I could get be brought to a place when I had no more problem with sin when I was dead to sin's solicitation it no longer ruled me in that sense in that I was continually committing this or that sin but I've come to see that the dominion of sin is other than that I've come to see that the dominion of sin over me is the guilt of sin now we've been used to thinking of the guilt of sin and the power of sin as two separate things I suppose the famous hymn, The Rock of of Ages, Cleft for Me, conveys that. One line of which, at least in the English version, is Save me from its guilt and power. The guilt of sin being one thing, and the power another thing. But I've come to see the power of sin over me is its guilt. Which makes it a much more terrible thing. A man may commit a sin, whatever it may be, a particular sin, only once in his life and never repeat it. And yet for years afterwards to be under the dominion of that sin in that that sin now has power to condemn him and to bring him a sense of guilt. And the passage of time does nothing to minimize that a skeleton in the closet for years he's not repeating it but just because he's not permitted grace to deal with that skeleton in the cupboard he's under its dominion it's like a blackmailer accusing him and I would say that that is the dominion of sin it's power to condemn me and to bring me under guilt It relates, of course, to larger matters or to -to day-to-day things. There may indeed be for us things in our lives about which we don't want anybody to ask us awkward questions. 
Things which are to this day condemning us. Things to this day about which we haven't got a testimony of release. Always there. Whenever we think in certain directions. It may be something like that or it may be the day-to-day -day things that happen. A whole accumulation of things which give you a sense of being condemned of having a sense of not being good enough a sense of guilt and I want to tell you I believe that is the true dominion of sin here for instance is a cup of coffee or it was full of coffee you had it before you went to bed the other evening but you were too tired to wash the cup afterwards but you said oh I'll, that'll be alright I'll just leave it it'll, it'll look after itself and the next morning the coffee certainly was gone but the stains were left well you say that's quite easy you just leave it a day or two this is of course the sort of argument that men uh, uh, indulge in when uh, their wives have to be away from home and <laughs> they're left with the dishes and they would like to feel that you just leave a thing the thing will clean itself but it does nothing of the sort and when the wife comes home she sees the accumulation of days of dishes and the stains are still there and so it is with us those things may not be necessarily being repeated in the present they're gone you're not necessarily repeating them but the stain is still there accusing us and bringing us a sense of guilt now I want to suggest that this is the reason why the devil trips us up and causes us to fall not merely that we should do something unethical he's very glad to get us to do that but rather having done it that unethical thing could continue to condemn us and to accuse us and to bring us under guilt and so I would suggest that this is the dominion of sin which in a sense is more inexorable than perhaps the usual conception of it maybe there's nothing particularly that's got you that's so fascinated you you can't stop doing it but you can still be under the dominion of things that have happened there they are staining the conscience staining the cup under the dominion of sin but we are promised as a way of release but before we come to that I want to look at the, the th second thing this verse speaks about it speaks about the law because it says you're not under the law but under grace and it suggests doesn't it that it is possible for us apart from stepping into a new place with God to be still under the law now the law in the Bible uh, is the ceremonial law of Moses and along with it more important than the ceremonial law the moral law the ceremonial law related to the services of the tabernacle, the temple and the offering much else and that of course has passed away it's no longer binding upon us today but the moral law as revealed in the Ten Commandments uttered from Mount Sinai has never been abrogated and the phrase being not under the law does not mean that that moral law is, is abrogated it's still there it's still an expression of God's will thou shalt thou shalt not now the phrase to be under the law means this to seek peace and restoration to God by means of trying to obey that moral law it's binding on us certainly it's an expression of God's will and to be under it in the Pauline sense of the word means I'm trying to, to restore myself to get free from the dominion the thing that's crushing me by my effort to keep that holy law and that of course is the natural thing for us all to do when we are conscious of failure when we're conscious of that dreadful hangover of guilt because you know the, the uh, 
sin can be one thing but what the devil builds on it can be another a great superstructure of accusation and very often the superstructure is out of all proportion to the thing on which it's built and it can blot out the sun for you and take away your joy and make you feel a just a hypocrite and how can we serve the Lord in that condition and when we're in that sort of place the natural thing for all of us is really to have recourse to what Paul calls the law you say well if I improve if I make a new attempt to embrace the standards of a victorious life if I make a new consecration that's the way to rid myself of my darkness and my burden but actually to have recourse to the law is to make your situation worse rather than better because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 sin, uh, uh, the law actually strengthens sin have you, do you know that verse? the strength of sin is the law the strength of sin are the Ten Commandments you might have thought that the strength of sin was temptation that's how most of us would do it no no the strength of sin is the law how is that? why those Ten Commandments which I now embrace afresh for myself actually only give sin the greater occasion to accuse me and condemn me they give sin more to accuse me of look what you promised look what God commands look what you've done look where you are and thus it is our attempt to try and get peace with God to get blessing to get fulfillment of the spirit anything you like by means of improvement or doing more for God or coming up to certain standards actually it makes my situation worse that's exactly what you've got in Romans 7 you have a man in Romans 7 this is Paul's experience in the next chapter who tells you what it was like to try and get right with God by the deeds of the law and he found that the good that he would he didn't do and the evil that he would not that he did he found that the commandment which was ordained to life he found to be unto death do you understand that, 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 that verse? at Sinai the covenant was very clear this do and thou shalt live but it was also implied this fail to do and thou shalt die and of course we've all failed to do it so all we've got from this law this holy righteous expression of the will of God which we've tried to do but failed is a condemnation is death the commandment which was ordained to life had I been able to keep it I found to be unto death and so it is that the law only adds to the dominion of sin it gives it more strength to do that terrible work and more than that it gives Satan his power over us I like to think as, uh, of Satan as the jailer do you call them jailer? the man who looks after the prisoners in prison the Lord of God says the wages of sin is death and the devil says now I'm going to see they get it in good measure not only the second death but here and now I'm going to see that they really feel that they are prisoners indeed and this very law that I run to hoping for good things for myself from is actually that which gives the devil his power over me he's called the accuser of the brethren and what does he accuse them with? he accuses them where the very law and the very standards of victory which they espouse you know by the way in which the devil accuses us you aren't, haven't done this, you haven't prayed enough you haven't won souls enough, you haven't witnessed enough you, you aren't holy enough you know you would think he was a holiness preacher by the things he accuses us of he's nothing of the sort <laughs> all he wants to do is to get you real down and he does it by the very thing to which naturally we all gravitate as our only hope the law our promises our efforts and, and, and more than that even as you then try and serve the Lord the devil sees that one of his special demons is sitting on your shoulder as you try and teach that Sunday school class and as you try and teach them he says hypocrite 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 he's done that to me when I've been preaching there's something been accusing me 
something I haven't got right with the Lord about but I'm trying to do my bit and that demon said you hypocrite stop it now friends I want how do you get on? not very well and all this in turn leads a person to more sin you're so down you feel so out of touch with God that nothing really is going to be lost by a little more sin <laughs> could you lose much more and that's the way in which this dominion of sin does actually lead us to the committing of more sin it does not basically consist in merely its attractiveness it consists as I've said in its ability to, to condemn you which in turn makes you feel so out of touch that a little more isn't going to make much difference and so we go down and down an illustration to me that's appropriate here is the illustration of the tablecloth on Sunday morning and mum puts a nice clean tablecloth on the table on Sunday for Sunday breakfast and the family are awfully very uh, uh, careful or try to be uh, that they don't make spill, spill anything on the clean tablecloth and if any of the children do hey, the, the, the cry goes up and uh, reprimands because that precious tablecloth has got one stain upon it but by Wednesday <laughs> there's so many stains upon it that another one doesn't make any difference it's all part of the general pattern and that's the state in which you and I can be even though we're believers groaning under the law wishing for better things but everything going the other way and there's so much wrong a little more is only going to be part of the general pattern and so this verse speaks of the dominion of sin in as much as it says it shall not have dominion it implies that sometimes it does it also speaks of the law in as much as it tells us we shall see now what that means you're no longer under it but it, and it also speaks of grace you're no longer under the law but under grace let me recite that verse then to you and see the cadence of it for sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under the law which gives sin the bigger opportunity to accuse you but uh, you're under grace which points you to Jesus and his blood now let's be quite clear what we mean by grace I'm perhaps telling you what you know only too well grace is not something merely that you say before meals it's not only strength it's imparted to you oh Lord I'm going through a big trial give me grace to go through it's not merely that much base, more basically grace is simply an element in the divine character it's that element in his character which makes him glorious in a way that nothing else does it's that element in the divine character which makes the angels veil their faces in wonder and worship what is it? is it the same as love? yes and no there is a link between love, the love of God and the grace of God love is his beneficence to all his creatures to the whole of creation but when the object of his love doesn't deserve it but deserves rather the reverse but still is love and has things done for it the love of God is called by a different name it's called the grace of God if it be of grace then it is no more of works otherwise grace is no more of grace perhaps the best distinction between the love of God and the grace of God is the distinction between the sunlight what a beautiful thing sunlight is sometimes in the summer you get a bit too much of it but we don't get too much in, in England and oh how we appreciate the sun and a sunny day we can put up a little bit of heat that sun it bathes everything with its wonderful rays what a beautiful thing sunlight is but there's something more beautiful than sunlight it's the rainbow and what's the rainbow? it's sunlight still but sunlight shining through rain on dark thunderclouds and then the sunlight is split up to its component parts 
and you have the most beautiful phenomenon in nature the rainbow and the love of God becomes the grace of God when the one loved doesn't deserve it when the one loved is in tears when the one loved mourns over its failures and finds it still loved and it is the wonderful truth of the gospel is that God loves the sinner and that all the sin of man has been powerless to put God against man he's put man against God but never put God against man he's loved still and that is grace that's why you were saved at all because he loved sinners and that love shone on the thundercloud and the sin and the failure and we see something more beautiful than love we see grace it's God doing things for men on the grounds that they deserve nothing and you do deserve nothing and everyone if we only knew how wrong we really were in God's sight can be candidates for the grace of God what makes you a candidate for grace Oh, of course, the fact you're living a good life. Man, grace wouldn't be grace if a good life qualified you for it. It's, it's because you haven't been. And if you can somehow see yourself as a failure, as a sinner, as a Christian who's a, a pathetic effort of one, and confess that fact, then, my friend, just because grace is on the throne, you become a candidate for that marvelous grace of our loving Lord grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt if to be under the law means trying to get blessing by means of the works of that law which you could never really keep and do to be under grace is consenting to receive everything as a gift to a man that doesn't deserve it even the fullness of the Holy Spirit is given to us as the gift of grace. The fullness of His Holy Spirit is not the reward of your faithfulness, but God's gift to your weakness. Is that really true? Sure. So all I have to have to be a candidate is weakness, yes. And emptiness, yes. Well, then that's just fine because I've got plenty of that. Well, praise the Lord then, brother. These very things, rightly understood and honestly confessed, make us candidates of that marvellous grace. Grace is flowing like a river. Millions there have been supplied. Still it flows as fresh as ever from the Saviour's wounded side. And to be under grace, is to be a recipient of the blessings of God without regard to whether we deserve it or not. Your good under grace doesn't help you. And your bad under grace, if truly confessed, need be no hindrance to you. You're going to be dealt with without any reference to your good or your bad. I'm sorry about that. Those of us have been trying so hard to be good. This is what enraged Israel when the Lord spoke that he brought with him the message of grace and it made nothing of their goodness they were trying so hard and they weren't going to stand for it do you remember when he said there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha but none of them was healed but Naaman the Syrian a Gentile and grace passed by the Jews of those days who were so punctilious his goodness, his ceremonial did nothing to commend itself and it reached a man outside the covenant and it was then they took up stones and tried to throw him over the hill they were furious that this message made nothing of their goodness but on the other hand how encouraging it means that you're wrong and your failures need be no hindrance to you if they're honestly confessed you're going to be met by and blessed by and dealt with by divine grace this is what we love to say saved by grace yes I believe we don't realize that's a trite expression but oh how precious not a chance for any of us where we having to 
be only under the law so sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under the law but under grace and the great supreme act of the grace of God was for God to give his son for a world that had its back to him thou didst not spare thine only son but gave him for a world undone and freely with that blessed one thou givest all you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for our sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich he was under no obligation to do it God needn't have done it people think that well, oh forgiveness of sins that's what God's for nothing of the sort he hasn't got to forgive anybody he hasn't got to save anybody if he threw a lot of us into hell no angel in the sky would charge him with injustice the thing that they can't get over is he did the very opposite so loving that world that he, w he was willing to part with that eternal son who can tell the love of the father for that son and yet he so loved the world he was willing for the son to go through that that's grace and Jesus giving himself up to the cross there on the cross accepted the responsibility for our sins and our infringement of the, of the divine law which make us incur the curse of the broken law and he became a curse for us that you might never bear the curse and doing that settling the issue with the law which we had broken he robbed sin of its power to condemn thou hast fulfilled the law says a lovely hymn and we are justified ours is the blessing but thine the curse we live for thou hast died and when Jesus said it's finished it meant that sin thereafter had no far, far, further power to condemn and the first person it lost its power to condemn was Jesus it had power over him the moment he took my sins and my sorrows and made them his very own he came into that realm where judgment must fall upon him because that's the due reward of sin but having borne it having extinguished that fire of God against human sin sin had nothing more to do it lost its power to condemn the Lord Jesus there was such sufficiency in the blood that he shed there was no reason for him to lie a moment longer in that grave and the third day God raised him from the dead as a sign that sin had lost its power to condemn our surety our substitute but if it's lost its power to condemn our substitute who had all us all of the sins of the world on him it's lost its power to condemn you and me Amen. and you're not, you, you needn't be under the dominion of sin for any longer than it takes you to get to the foot of the cross and confess it for Jesus has finished it and you can be free sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law that would condemn you but under grace that points you to Calvary where Jesus finished it all and so this is the great charter of our freedom You say, what does it mean to be dead to sin? Because this is what the, the passage is about. First verse, shall we continue in sin that grace may be bound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? What does it mean to reckon yourselves dead indeed into sin? In the light of what we've said, may I suggest 
there's a very simple meaning for it now if you want to know what it means to be dead unto sin you've got to remind yourself in verse 10 that Jesus in that he died he died unto sin once now usually we think of Jesus dying for sin but here we're told he died unto it why that's the very thing I'm asking myself what does it mean to be dead to sin what did it mean to, for Jesus to be dead to sin because what it meant for him to be dead to sin will surely show me what it means for me to be dead to sin now what did it mean for Jesus he died unto sin not for it but unto it like I'm called to do now if I think to be dead to sin is to get to a wonderful place of sanctification where I'm dead to sin solicitations where they mean nothing to me I shall be in trouble understanding it and actually of course very often uh, it has been taught as if it is that we're dead to sin solicitations and I've heard the illustration now I said dead, being dead to sin reckon yourself dead now here's a drunkard here's an alcoholic and he can't resist liquor but he dies and there's his corpse you can put all the bottles of booze you like round him and he won't lift a finger to, to get a bottle to his lips he's dead to booze well <laughs> he certainly is the illustration is fact of course but I don't think that's what means this look did it mean that there came a point in Jesus life when he died unto sin he died unto sin solicitation no it doesn't because he never was alive to them indeed he could say the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me nothing that he can appeal to in me therefore Jesus being dead to sin can't mean that what did it mean in that he died in that he said it's finished in that precious blood was shed he died unto sin's power to condemn it once and for all never again will he be called in question to pay the debt it's done and sin could no longer hold him for three days there was joy in hell because they thought they'd got our champion <laughs> but the third day it was turned to groan from up from the dead he rose showing that the work was enough sin had lost its power Satan had lost the one he thought he'd captured he died unto sin likewise likewise you reckon yourself dead to sin in the sense you reckon yourself dead to sin's power to condemn you having repented oh that's implied having taken God's side about it are you going to go on still licking your wounds because repentance important as it is by itself doesn't set the soul really free having repented and having known something of the accusations of Satan having judged it and gone to Jesus with it you are to dare to believe you're dead to sin's power to go on thrashing you it lost its power at Calvary over your substitute and what the substitute did your record as having done as well and sin need not have dominion over you you need not go on that wretched treadmill going further and further down feeling worse and worse and feeling whether you're so much out of touch what does it matter too much what you do you need not to be on that for you're not under the law which certainly would rub and rub it in but under grace that tells you that Jesus has done it all it's a finish, it's finished the Messiah dies, cut off the sins but not his own accomplished is the sacrifice the great redeeming work is done and I'm going to suggest to you that is what that word that tantalized me so for so long means basically I don't need to go on thrashing myself I don't need to go on torturing myself 
I'm not going to improve. The old man isn't going to prove, improve. He's corrupt according to deceitful lusts, we're told. Well, the way he acts is just the way I would think he would act if God's word is true. And, the, and that cross tells me that old man, or the only thing was he was fit for, was not dedication, but death. And that death has been carried out in the person of my substitute. And when he, and if he should, express himself, I say back to the cross. And I'm not going to accept any more thrashings from the devil than it, and for any longer than it takes me to get to Jesus. Amen. Confess that thing and dare to believe there's power in that blood Amen. to set me free. Amen. Sin shall not have dominion over you. And of course, this just before we go I don't think we need to take it on as li long as you said we might uh, 10 o'clock anyway there's no reason why you shouldn't you shouldn't uh, slip away at any point amen all right now brother Jim you 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 close us with prayer then we'll have something on the piano and then a moment or two and then just a little while we'd love to hear from you are you praising? Has this been? Are you being helped these days? Have you got something to say? Put it on record for the glory of the Lord, not for the benefit of the speakers, but give glory to God that He, by His blood, He has saved you; by His power, He has raised you, and and brought you into a new freedom. Oh, there are many other things. Pam and I said, "Oh, but we ought to talk about this." Oh, but we must bring in the other, but we couldn't. But we said, "This is what we believe God wants us to hear, dear one, sin." shall not have dominion over you. <laughs> Isn't it good news? Amen. You're not under the law, but under grace. Amen. Father, I thank you for the word that you shared tonight. And I confess to you that I needed the message this week. Thank you for it. Father, I don't know what experience I've had. I don't even understand all that I've heard. But I know that there's been an element of truth that has been missing in my life. Father, I thank you that uh, in the days to come when that demon of self-consciousness and self-effort and all of those things that are of the flesh and the own nature, which is what I am, when they start to haunt me that I can remember this message, that I can know that I'm set free, set free to be a slave, and then to have my fruit unto holiness and righteousness. Father, I just uh, thank you for the truth. And I anticipate in the days to come learning to put it into practice simply by believing and claiming the blood. I thank you, Father, for uh, the revelation to my spirit that you've given this week. And Father, I praise you that this can be and should be and will be an added dimension in each of our lives. Uh, we thank you for Brother Roy and Pam and for their ministry and for the Spirit of God as he has uh, so marvelously worked through them to open our hearts and give us understanding. Now, Father, I pray that as we continue through this evening that you would just open us, open up our spirit, help us to be honest and to be free. And if there's something that needs to be shared, to do it. And if there's not, then we don't need to. But we just want you to be Lord in our midst. Uh, Father, we just pray that you might prompt our hearts and uh, help us to say those things. If indeed you have laid them on our hearts, that would be pleasing to you. Bless each person who has come tonight. And we pray that Satan will not be able to snatch away the truth that they have heard tonight. But in the days to come, that this message would be a source of victory when they feel condemned and when they feel... Uh, let down and depressed because of who they are and what they've done. I ask you in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. 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 I'll tell you what, why don't we have Steve uh, sing a song or two and then we'll stand up and relax and just take a two or three minute break and then if some of you need to go, you feel free to do that and we'll sit down and conclude the service. <laughs>
if you do need to go, you go ahead. We, I want the, I want some of us to stay for two or three reasons. Number one, if God has something to confirm in, in your heart that's been done this week that you need to share with the others, we want to do that. And then number two, after uh, we finish here, and I don't think it'll take too long, I want the, uh, those of you who want to stay around to have a word with the Brother Lord and So if you can stay, we'd love for you to. If you have to go, that's fine. Please just take a minute to stretch and relax. Get a drink of water, boy.